Thumbs up to get started, probably two minutes.
as a, on the DTC cloud. So we're excited that we have this amazing partner right now. I'll let Raj introduce Thank you. your team members. Thank you, Keith. I appreciate that. So I'm Rod Little Hales. I'm the sales director for the Southwest. <clears throat> My boss is over there, Noel. He runs the Western US. And uh, over here we have David. So David actually is a resident of San Diego and uh, he's one of our engineers. He's actually going to help me with the presentation. I'm going to talk a bit about the value proposition and, and what the technology is. And then David's going to do more of a technical deep dive. Um, and then uh, Curtis, sorry, thank you. Curtis has joined us. Uh, he's a relatively new engineer with us as well. So uh, he's joined us for the day here too. So uh, great turnout. Thanks everyone for, for coming. I definitely appreciate uh, you coming to listen to this presentation. So. Um, I'm going to give you this. This is probably going to take about 20, 25 minutes to talk uh, a little bit about Atlantis. If you have any questions, just put your hand up. Um, if I can't answer them, I'm sure these guys over here can. Um, okay, so we're going to talk the, about the environment. What are the challenges that most people face when they're deploying ZDI? Um, uh, you know, and why are they doing it? And then we're going to talk about Atlantis and, and the, the problems that it solves. So let's talk a little bit about the company Atlantis first of all. So Atlantis was founded in 2006. Um, we had a product that we started selling in 2009. And in that short time, in those last four years, we have uh, deployed some of the largest BDI deployments in the world, right? And so. We kind of cut our teeth in the financial space, and uh, the largest deployments of VDI, the, the largest is JP Morgan Chase. They run on Atlantis. They have 100,000 seats of Atlantis, 100,000 seats of VDI as well. Uh, Bank of America would be another one. There are a lot of large financial organizations that, uh, that we work with, but we've won a lot of awards, right? Last year, VMworld, um, we won you know, Best of VMworld 2012 for our technology, and in Europe, we also won Best of VMworld for our uh, deployment with, with Colt, uh, and Best of Synergy 2012 with Citrix. So uh, getting a lot of good press recently on Atlantis. Uh, got uh, some solid funding behind us. We are a profitable company, uh, but we've got some solid funding behind us. Uh, Cisco is a, an investor in our, in our company. And our strategic relationship to Core Citrix and VMware, because obviously they have the desktop hypervisor. Um, also, IBM, we have a strategic relationship with BCE um, and, and Dell. Um, and these are a few of our, our customers. I'm going to step you through a few more just so that you get an idea of who we traditionally work with. They're our largest customer, JP Morgan, um, but Washington Trust Bank, the Army is a big one. Um, and this talks a little bit about some of the industry sectors that we're in, right? So we do very well in healthcare and government. Healthcare and government tend to do a lot of stateless deployments, and we'll talk about the difference between persistent and stateless when we get there. Uh, and of course, we have a lot of the financial services folks, um, retail services, education, and, uh, and technology. Qualcomm down there, they're down here in San Diego. But we have a lot of large you know, customers, many of whom are in the Fortune 500. So the point here is this is very much a proven technology. And, and probably the most important thing is it's proven at scale. right? So one of the things we're going to talk about today is how you can deploy VDI and you can make it work when it's small. But when you start to scale, it gets very, very tricky uh, and hard to do. And we'll talk about why that is. Um, but we, you know, we're, we're definitely a proven technology at scale in, in this space. So, okay, um, talked about this. We, we have on our team, we have virtualization experts that have been doing the DDI for 14 years. I didn't even think VDI had existed for 14 years, but apparently it has. But we have a deep bench of expertise, right, um, specifically around VDI in our company. So. What is Atlantis? Atlantis is a software-only product. People call it a software appliance, but it is literally just software. It can take advantage of the existing infrastructure that you already have from a hardware perspective, but it truly is just software. Um, it runs on a virtual machine. Now, we are hypervisor agnostic, so it doesn't matter whether it's Hyper-V or VMware or Citrix but it just runs in a virtual machine. 
um, on any hypervisor. Okay, so um, <coughs> you can see here how where we fit into the uh, the logical pattern here, right? Is we, we, that's where we fit, just underneath the hypervisor. Um, we work with any servers and we work with any storage. The big advantage to that for customers that want to, you know, that, that move fairly quickly and take advantage of new technologies and oftentimes they replace their servers with the latest and greatest chipset or they replace their storage with the latest and greatest storage. When you're a software only product, it's very, very easy when you're sitting in a virtual machine to move around very flexibly right in the data center. So it doesn't matter if you swap out your servers, you swap out your storage, we're just sitting on a virtual machine and we can move around. Uh, we're not hardware dependent in any way. Uh, so what do we do? Well, as Keith mentioned, we are basically sitting in RAM and we're going to use RAM as primary storage. So in your server, you have a certain amount of RAM. We are going to put a virtual machine in RAM. We're going to leverage that as our primary storage. Uh, for stateless desktops, also known as diskless, you can run the entire VDI instance in RAM. You don't need anything outside of that. For persistent desktop, which is where there's some unique data from users, we might need some additional external storage. Now that could either be an I.O. card, like a Fusion I.O., or it could be SSD, or it could be JPOD. doesn't really matter. Um, uh, if we just need the capacity outside of that for some of that unique data to, to sit on, right? It uh, doesn't matter if it's SAN or NAS. <coughs> um, you know, we work with, with all of these technologies, and it works with, with Windows XP, Windows 7. A lot of customers that are moving to Windows 7, they find there's a big jump in their IOPS, and that's when they tend to call in Atlantis and say, hey, we could, uh, we could definitely use your help here. Windows 8? Yeah, we work on Windows 8. I mean, we don't, there aren't too many massive deployments of Windows 8 yet. But. Um, <clears throat> so a couple of different types, right? Diskless VDI, right? It's also known as stateless. This is where there's quite a lot of work, pre-work typically, that needs to be done when you're deploying stateless VDI, because what you're saying is, you know, this individual in this role will only see certain applications. This individual in this other role will see different applications. And every time they log in, they're going to see the same format, the same view, same image of those applications. Um, so when customers start to deploy VDI, they think, hey, you know, stateless is the perhaps the better way to go because it requires less infrastructure. What they sometimes don't realize is there is a huge amount of work that needs to be done up front to identify and prioritize your images and your applications and determine who's going to see what. All right. Um, <clears throat> so generally speaking, if customers want to deploy VDI, it's much quicker and easier to do persistent because you, you don't really care. I mean, you, you don't have to do all that. Uh, application prioritization. Um, and with Atlantis, you'll see that you can easily deploy persistent without many of the shortcomings that people traditionally assume go along with persistent desktop. Um, so about 30% of uh, VDI desktops today are deployed as, as stateless. Um, very high performance, no physical storage or SSD you know, when you're running stateless with, with Atlantis Ilio, the whole thing sits in RAM. So there is no additional storage required on the back end. You don't need I.O. cards. You don't need a sand fabric controllers, all the other things that go along with, you know, storage on the back end of your, your server platform. Um, you're running everything in RAM. Don't need to worry about configurations and having uh, storage engineers manage the environment sizing the storage, any of that. Um, about 70% of the market is persistent, right? So this is where you're not going to change anything in your environment in terms of your desktop images when you're going to present that virtual desktop to the end user. It's much easier and quicker to deploy um, as a result. We're going to give you, and this is really what this whole presentation is all about, is we're going to give you better than PC performance 
at a lower cost than a PC. The two biggest challenges that people face when they deploy VDI is it costs more than a desktop, <laughs> which people are thinking when they go into it, they're thinking we're going to save money by virtual desktop. Then after the fact, after they start to deploy it, they realize this is actually more expensive and they get worse performance. And so the end user experience is worse than if they just bought a PC. These are the two problems that Atlantis solves. Right, so we will guarantee that we will give you better than PC performance at lower than PC cost um, by using in-memory VDI with our software, right? And in terms of automating the deployment of these solutions, as I said, we work at scale so we can deploy across thousands of machines, you know, in a few clicks of a button um, very easily. And we also work with ZenApp, ZenApp is basically just a virtualized application that sits in a VM. Um, so we do the same thing for ZenApp as we do for VDI. I know that Citrix nowadays, when they sell you ZenApp, they bundle Zen Desktop or the other way around. So most of the customers that I meet with have both. Um, but just know that we can do the same thing for VDI <coughs> and ZenApp. Right, so why is it unique? Well. Um, Lower cost, faster than a desktop, right? We're going to dig into this a little further. Um, we're the only solution for stateless with absolutely zero storage involved. Um, we'll throw out a couple of numbers here, and these are absolutely true figures. I've done lots of ROI analysis, in fact, some for a couple of companies here today. Um, for stateless VDI, we will give you. A, we will provide you a virtual desktop at below two hundred dollars, and we'll deliver three hundred IOPS per end user. For uh, persistent, it'll be also three hundred IOPS at least. Sometimes it can be in the thousand, but it'll be at least three hundred IOPS per end user at below three hundred dollars. Um, it's fully automated in terms of once you buy the product, you deploy the product. It does all the sizing and. Uh, and all the carving up of the RAM in an automated fashion, so there's really no human involvement. Um, we talked about, you know, if you stateless is quite hard to do because there's a ton of work up front that needs to be done in, in, in organizing your images and who's going to see what. So a lot of customers, they start with persistent because it's easier and quicker to deploy, and then they move to a stateless environment over time, and that's very easy to do with Atlantis. It means that you can get the project started sooner uh, take advantage of the lower cost desktop with better performance, but move to that stateless environment over time without any infrastructure changes. Right? That's the critical thing, again, with the software sitting in a VM. So you're not going to have to change anything in terms of the underlying hardware. Um, OK, so persistent, easiest first step into VDI, using the same image used as your PC image, same processes, same teams. Um, very easy, right? Very easy to get started. Uh, this is where, it's, you know, if you start with stateless, now there are some organizations where stateless works well, right? Healthcare, education, and some state and local government, um, because there are kind of a, a specific fixed number of applications that those users work with on a daily basis, right? So. In those organizations, it can be a little easier to deploy stateless. But I kid you not, I mean, there are some large enterprises that two years ago decided we're going to deploy BDI. They're still figuring out who's going to see what, right, and how we're going to present our images to the end user. I mean, it's a massive undertaking with some large enterprises that have thousands and thousands of applications, as you can probably imagine. So to start taking advantage of BDI now, a lot of companies are facing this, you know, bring your own device to work sort of thing. Um, you to start with persistent and migrate to, to non-persistent over time. OK, so one of the biggest problems um, with, well, let me take a step back. Right? I used to work for a large storage company. And when we would go into customers and they would say, hey, we want to deploy VDI, we would say, no problem. We will, you know, how many IOPS per end user do you want? Uh, Bearing in mind that this, even with a SATA drive, delivers 80, right? An SSD drive could deliver up to 5,000. Um, 
usually organizations would say, well, you know, maybe 30 to 50, right? So you say, okay, let's say you have 1,000 users and you want to deliver 50 IOPS. That's 50,000 IOPS. Now, one of the challenges with VDI is it's 80% write, 20% read. And cache in the controllers of storage doesn't do very well with writes. It does really well with reads, but not writes. So as a result, when you're sizing your backend storage to deliver those kind of IOPS, it's a math equation. You have to look at spindle count. I don't know if you're all familiar with, <coughs> with how that's done, but with storage, you look at buying an array, and you say, OK, let's say a 15K drive is 200 IOPS, which is fairly generous, but let's say it's, you give it 200 IOPS. You say, OK, for 50,000 IOPS, right, what is that? I need five. I need a lot, right? You need cabinets full of drives to, to guarantee that you can deliver the IOPS to the applications as and when they need them. Um, and I'll show you in a minute that 50 IOPS is not much, right? I mean, just a standard PC gives you 80. So what you're saying with 50 is we're not going to give you better than PC performance, but we're going to try and keep costs manageable because to deliver more would cost a fortune, right? Just because of the back-end storage requirement, adding all of these spindles together. And again, people think, well, don't worry, we've got, you know, we've got this great big storage array with tons of cash that doesn't solve the problem, unfortunately, with VDI because of the right heavy workload. Um, so with Atlantis, when you're running everything in RAM, you don't have to worry about any of this. You don't have to worry about your storage sizing in terms of how much, how do we deliver all of these IOPS to the end user. Um, you also don't have to worry about all of your, you know, your network connectivity. Do I go fiber channel? Do I go iSCSI? 1 gig, 10 gig, 8 gig, 16 gig, whatever it is, right? How many ports do I need on my switch? Um, you don't need to worry about any of that. All that kind of goes away. Now, many of you will have storage arrays in your environment that do other server workload traffic, and that's great. But when you add VDI into the mix, and you add it when you're running SQL and Oracle and Exchange and all of these other there are pretty high I.O. applications on that, on that array. You add VDI into the mix, it complicates masses even further, right? Because now you're taking resources from those other mission-critical databases, um, and it, VDI is just a massive I.O.P. hog, right? So, so you don't have to worry about anything that you're already running. You don't have to worry about sizing the storage or the network. Um, or you've got to do, you, you do have to worry about the servers and make sure you have enough RAM, and we're going to talk about that, right, because that is one piece that we do consume. Uh, but that's much easier and much less expensive than, than doing with the storage back end. Um, you don't need SSD, so a lot of customers say, well, you know, we've got this storage array, we're going to start to add trays of SSDs. Now, SSDs are pretty expensive, right, especially if you're buying SLC um, SSDs, which are kind of the more enterprise class SSDs. Um, and this, you know, this will save you a ton of money overdoing that, right? Um, or, you know, an SSD array um, or PCIe cards like Fusion I.O. cards in your, in your servers. Now, if you already have that, for persistent desktops, we can certainly take advantage of what you already have. Um, and we'll talk about that, that uh, we're going to use RAM as primary storage in persistent desktops. We will require some back-end storage, and we can certainly leverage your Fusion I.O. cards uh, or your violin memory arrays or whatever else you have, right, and SSD in the back end. Um, but what you'll find is what we're able to do is when customers say, okay, we're going to buy a tray of SSD, and this will last us for our first 500 users with persistent, when we start running everything in RAM, we'll say, actually, that tray of SSD, we can run multiple thousand users now on that SSD, right? So we can get you much greater density on your existing hardware assets that you've, you've bought. Um, so can provision full clones in seconds, and uh, with the automation, the deployment of VDI can be very, very fast. Automated storage sizing, when David gets to his presentation, he can talk a little bit about this, but we have a tool that basically goes in, looks at how much RAM you have in the server, you determine how many users you're going to have per server, um, and it will do all of the work for you, right, in terms of taking the RAM, carving it up, and assigning it out to the virtual machine. Um, automated deployment, we talked about the reduced network traffic, uh, and not having to deal with the storage backend. So this is really the critical thing, right, is eliminating 
the storage back end and the spindle count. So we talked about doing the math and saying, you know, to deliver, for example, 50,000 IOPS, I'm going to need a certain number of spindles. Invariably, that's what you're buying it for is the spindle count, not the capacity, right? Because virtual desktops are never going to use that kind of capacity. So what you find is you have a whole load of wasted capacity, but you just bought the spindles for the IOPS. Um, so here's an example. So here's 200 desktops running without Atlantis, right? And run these 200 desktops over time, and you can see the IOPS traffic without Atlantis, and then we add Atlantis, and you see the IOPS traffic down here. Now, there's a couple of reasons why we can so dramatically reduce the number of IOPS. In the technical presentation, David's going to get into it in much more detail, but basically one is we eliminate a lot of the unnecessary IOPS, right? Um, and then we do obviously deduplication and, and, and compression in the back end, um, but we make everything much, much faster as well. So instead, you know, you might be familiar with it, but Windows writes everything in 4K blocks. Right, we're going to take those 4K blocks, we're going to combine them together, and we're going to write everything at either 64K or 128K blocks. That significantly reduces the number of IOPS that your machines generate. Right, so we're getting rid of a lot of the IOPS that are not necessary, and we're also combining the uh, the writes and sending them all over at one time so that we reduce the number of IOPS. But this is a key to, to why our technology works so well. It's because we would significantly reduce the number of IOPS that are hitting the back-end storage. So when we talk about sizing, how many IOPS do you want to deliver to your end user? Um, you know, I talk to customers, I hear anything from 15, which is incredibly low, to, you know, three, 400 for a developer. Um, how many is enough? Well, as we talked about, you know, typical SATA driver gives you 75, 80 IOPS. MacBook Air will give you 5,000. So how many do you need for your for your end user, um, well, what will the applications actually take if you if you give it to them? Um, so this is for a, a single Windows 7 desktop running in RAM, uh, just taken over the day as we open up applications. We'll see we're spiking up sometimes to, to north of 3,500 IOPS. But if let's say you gave these applications as you were opening these applications, you gave them as many IOPS as they could possibly consume. Outlook will consume 975 IOPS when you open it. Now, it'll open in the blink of an eye, right? But it will consume 975 IOPS if you give it to it. So if you give it 50, if you give the end user 50 and you open up Outlook and you open up PowerPoint and you open up your, um, you know, Internet Explorer, they will open, but they will not open quickly, right? If the more IOPS you can give these applications when they open, the faster they'll get. So um, when, we run, when we run VDI in RAM, that is the fastest way to deliver IOPS. And that's how we can guarantee that we'll guarantee an end user at least 300 IOPS. Sometimes they'll see thousands, right? Depends on the density of number of users per virtual machine or number of users per, per session host. Um, but you can see these applications, how much they'll consume if, if, if given it. Um, and this is all about, again, about the end user experience. I've talked to customers who have, and this is not uncommon, by the way, for Atlantis. A customer starts to deploy BDI, not realizing how complex it can be and how much it's going to cost. And so they say, let's just give, let's start by giving the end user 50 IOPS. And people say, this is weak, right? This, this is not nearly as good as my PC. And yet, the management is looking at it going, God, it's expensive. I mean, they don't like it, and it's incredibly expensive. Um, and that's usually when we get called in, right? Can you help us? Because the end user experience is not good, and we don't want to keep deploying this stuff. Uh, we're paying much more than we thought we were, and nobody likes it. Um, and, and we have customers that's, that <laughs> have heard about this, and they say, hey, we're going to deploy Atlantis out of the gate. That's what we don't want to do. We don't want to deploy VDI and have it blow up in our face, because once people have rejected it, it's hard to try and do it again. Right? Once they've said we don't want it, and then you come and you say, hey, here's a second try, here's a third try, um, people get pretty frustrated with that. Right? So 
So the idea is make sure that you size it given enough IOPS so that you know that the end user experience that you're going to get is going to be uh, good. So in this scenario, open up these applications. Um, you know, the average is 443 IOPS, uh, and the maximum is, is 4,000 IOPS for a Windows update. A couple of things on this. Um, when people deploy VDI, oftentimes to limit the number of IOPS, they turn off certain features. Like they'll turn off antivirus or they'll turn off Windows search capabilities. Um, you don't have to. If you run Atlantis, you can leave those things on, right? Because we can we can meet that need, right? In terms of the IOPS requirement, uh, you don't have to turn off this, these these features within Windows. Um, okay, so again, how are we doing this? We're carving out a piece of RAM. What we're doing is we're going into the server. We'll ask you how much RAM do you have in the server. You maybe have 256 gig. Okay, we're going to say we need a bit of that. Right, we're going to have to run a bit of that because we're going to run a virtual machine in there. Um, and so we're going to take a little bit of, of the RAM and we're going to run a virtual machine running Atlantis in that host. Uh, and you're going to, we're going to do a bit of math and figure out, based on the number of IOPS that we want to deliver to the end user, how many users we want per host. Um, I would say generally it's kind of 65, 75, 80, somewhere in that region per host. Um, but no dependency on the physical storage in the back end. Uh, we also have uh, fast replication. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, and the shared storage. So RAM obviously is volatile. Um, we always keep the data in at least three places uh, so that you never lose information. Even if you lose a machine and the machine's shut down, the information is somewhere else. Remember, this is a virtual machine. We can leverage technologies such as you know, HA and vMotion just to vMotion uh, that workload over to another server. Um, and the persistent data is kept on external storage. So if you want to do uh, recovery, right, then you're going to go to that external storage, that SAN, or you know, in the back end. Um, let's talk about the back end storage for persistent quickly. You know, we don't need it for IOPS. We only need it for capacity, right? Um, so it doesn't really matter what you have in the back end. If you have already acquired fast storage for other applications, we can use it. Not a problem. We will, um, but, but we don't really need the IOPS in the back end storage. Uh, and yeah, this is the, this is the, the fastest BVI you're going to get on the planet, right? So there's a guy called um, Brian Madden who, who's written many books about BVI and he's endorsed this, right? He, he wrote a book about it actually, um, about this technology and how it is the fastest BVI deployment available. Uh, you get a 12 second boot time, uh, instant app, near instant app launches, uh, depending again on, on uh, the number of IOPS. Now, you know, we, we always say we'll deliver at least 300. Um, it can be thousands, right? Depending on how much, uh, how many IOPS the RAM will deliver and how many users you want to leverage that RAM. Um, but uh, very fast searches, and you don't have to worry about things like antivirus kicking off and slowing everyone down. Um, OK, so cut CapEx and OpEx costs. So let's talk a little bit about the capacity in the back end. We only need it for capacity. We don't need it for IOPS. But we're going to dedupe everything. Now, with VDI, an OS, if everybody is running the same OS, and everybody is running the same image, like Outlook or Excel or whatever, that gets fantastic dedupe, right? You only need one copy, and everybody points to that copy. When you have persistent desktop, there's some unique data, but frankly, it's not much. So we typically see 95% deduplication on VDI deployments. Uh, we, we dedupe from the virtual machine, and then we do a to, to, to a replication host, which is also a virtual machine, and then we dedupe again. So there's two dedupe stages, but we typically get just about always in excess of 90%, um, but we typically get around 95% dedupe. So you have 50 terabytes, you're looking at one terabyte backend storage outside of RAM, right, um, that you might need for the persistent data. But, you know, huge amounts less than you typically would. Um, <clears throat> and you get many, many more users on the solution. Uh, and as we talked about, use 
any shared storage. So we do the DG and we do the compression. So get the IOPS out of RAM, whatever storage you do need in the back end, you don't need much of it and it doesn't need to be fast. Um, so three to 400 average IOPS per desktop bursting to 5,000. See that 12 second boot time, less than one second app launches and uh, instant search capability. Uh, so here's an example of a customer that we did where they had, uh, they did, with, you know, delivering 30 uh, IOPS. And we look here, uh, you know, they required nearly, nearly 5,000 disks to meet the IOPS requirement. Um, you know, you do the math and you see that they're, to they're paying about $1,172 per desktop. Now, one of the things that we do for customers is before we do any kind of a deployment, we do an ROI analysis for you. We can use industry standard numbers. The more information you can provide us, the better in terms of what you pay for storage. We, we know how much storage costs, right? So we can give you an idea. But uh, you know, what do you pay for the physical hardware, right? Where you pay for controllers and the tray and all the drives, right? Um, and then as you add additional shells of disk, we take that into consideration how much it costs to scale out. There are OPEX costs, right? Maintenance fees on the array, power, cooling, rack space. We can take that all into consideration because remember, you're not going to need it with Atlantis. And we say, OK, based upon what you have today, as you scale out, your total cost per desktop is going to be X. And we'll be pretty, very close, right? And then we run it with Atlantis, right? Getting rid of that back-end storage requirement or dramatically reducing it by 95% and we'll give you a new cost per desktop um, and it will be less than the cost of a PC. And in that number, we're including the cost of the server and the cost of the RAM and the cost of the Atlantis software, right? So we're including all of that and we will deliver a VDI experience with 300 IOPS or better or less than the cost of a PC. But Using backend storage, you'll never get to less than the cost of a PC. Using SSD, IO cards, you're just not going to be able to do it. It's, it's just not, not feasible. Yeah, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. oh, 14,000 desktops. What do you think you're eliminating backend storage completely? So for stateless, yes, we're eliminating it completely. For persistent, we're dramatically minimizing it. There's some unique data. Right, that's going to sit on back-end storage because it's unique. It's not going to sit in the RAM. Bingo, exactly. Well, it's if it's non-persistent, you mean? Well, when next time you boot on, you're going to see that same image come up. Right. This is pretty much all we do is like redirect the docs and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. So effectively, yeah, because when the stateless environment, the, the premise is that you're not guaranteeing the same desktop every time. So if you have a catastrophic failure of new users or you know, a high level turnover in your user pool, effectively, you get, you're not still guaranteed you get the same image. So can you still save the local drive? Sure. And it just stores in memory. The memory that's allocated post DB for that specific desktop. Whether or not it stays persistent or not, the answer is no, we can't guarantee that because it's the whole premise is it's stateless. Now, what you can do, though, obviously, you mentioned that, you mentioned that, is you map a network drive if it's mission critical or something that needs to be backed up and saved in archives for later. Right? So there's certainly that option. Right. It's not a new requirement for anyone else. What you do with DDI. So you see, in this, in this instance, required 84% fewer disks. And as I said, we'll do the ROI analysis. The other thing that we do is, uh, will show you, will tell you exactly how, how many fewer disks you need, how many fewer IOPS you'll generate using Atlantis. Um, they, in this case, they got 10x the IOPS with 96% fewer, fewer disks. Massive amounts in storage savings. I know when you look at this, you think 12 million bucks. It seems like a big number, but when you have thousands of desktops, it is a big number because of just the sheer amount of storage you need on the back end to deliver the IOPS. It is a huge number. That's why people deploy 100 or 200 or 300, and then a red flag goes up, and they go, hang on, to keep going is just going to be outrageous, right? And that's generally speaking when we get called in. Um, and again, we're getting you down to uh, 
the cost of under a desktop. So um, at this point, I think I want to pass it over to David. David, do you want to take this slide and? Uh, Okay, no problem. Uh, why don't you do that? And he's going to go into the technical aspects of the product. I'll give you this too. What time is it now? Yeah, so that's uh, so one. So that's a good question because, um, as far as my portion of the discussion goes today, um, what I want to do is find out a couple things. So I can talk at a very low level about um, how our architecture works, and talk quite a bit about some of our patent tech, our patents relating to our technology. Um, but what I really want to do, obviously, in the limited amount of time we have, is make this as useful as possible for you folks. So, so we've seen that I've seen come up a couple of times the benefits are using this in the simplification, finding the right, uh, reducing the GI options of that nature. But you know, what do you tell people when they ask you how your product compares to the built-in ability of that app and desktop to run uh, the right path? Okay, we can talk about that. Sure. Um, so what I'm going to do uh, as a precursor to starting the training is write a few bullet items on the board. And for the folks monitoring us on the phone, the WebEx, I'm sorry, the GoToMeeting, I'll read them off for you. So the one is uh, relating to the uh, RAID write and read penalties. And I'll talk about that uh, in depth and how they, how they impact IOPS. Uh, next, I want to talk about, uh, as you brought up, PVS caching in the Citrix environments. And again, what that means in terms of IOPS and latency. Okay. So, quick question for everyone in the crowd. Um, are you familiar with the concept of the write penalties using RAID? Yeah. So, is anyone not? Has everyone, is everyone familiar with the term uh, hydration or rehydration upon reads? Is everyone, if, yeah, I, can, I can go over real quick if you'd like. So we're all good on that? I'm sorry? Okay, so one of the challenges upon reading data from a disk is this concept of hydration. So if I have a large file and it's spread across multiple disks in an array, if we have a deduplication engine that has written that data, in a deduplicated format into a RAID, whether it be RAID 5, RAID 6, what have you, depending upon the physical locality of that data, it's going to take a certain amount of time to grab all that data, put it into memory, undedupe it, or, and then send it back to the requester. So that is effectively what's called hydration. And in most cases, with dedupe type engines, um, I'll use my former employer's example, data domain, this is a significant problem for them because of the way data is laid out on disk over time. And there's two concepts to that. One concept is what's called spatial locality, and the other is predictive locality. And effectively what that means is in spatial locality, if I have, say, five chunks of data that are written in a sequential format um, based upon the I.O. pattern, that technology would say, well, if you want bytes two and three, I'm going to send one four and five along with it because I think that's what you might want next to each other. And there's this other concept of predictive technology or predictive um, fetching where if I have A, B, C, D, and E pieces of data, if you ask for B and C, um, I'm going to predict that because A and B, E and B, A, B, A, B, A, B, rather, are physically close, I'm predicting that, well, you are going to also want those as well. So the challenge is finding all of them, right? If they're spread across 
50 disks, 100 disks, 200 disks, that takes a while. It's a lot of IOPS. That's a lot of latency. Okay, so that's the concept of hydration upon reads. And I, I say that because we're going to talk a lot about this, not only for how our deduplication engine works, but also for Citrix, uh, how, this, how this is how it works with the PBS tile and MTS as well. So um, moving on, what I want to do also, bear with me one sec is talk a little bit about a couple slides. So the first slide I want to talk about effectively is just basically a graphical representation of what we just talked about with regards to the IO penalty that you pay upon write uh, in RAID. Specifically, we have a nice diagram showing 0, 1, uh, 5, and 6. The typical solutions that we see out in the real world are RAID 5, RAID 6. Now, another thing, too, about these RAID penalties is they scale. Okay, so as you add users, you add IOPS, you add latency, the scale goes up as well. And in most cases, it's almost linear. So think about that as we move forward. And the reason why I put these bullet points up is I want you to think about these concepts as a precursor as we move forward with the presentation. Exactly. Exactly. So this is an example of a, a basic calculation of what happens and when you tack on the penalty. Uh, basically, the slide just goes and shows um, your reads, your writes, tacks on the penalty, looks at the IOP. So what this slide doesn't really show is the latency per IOP. So if you imagine each IOP, say, takes 60 milliseconds as an example, multiply that by how many IOPs you have, and that gives you a time derivative of what that would take to grab that file or that piece of data that you need. For rights. Thank you. There. Okay. Thank you. So think about the amount of time it would take to either write or read a file based upon that concept. And again, Think about how fast disks are across, say, the average workday. So typically in a workday when you have an office environment, you have two big spikes of traffic. When everyone comes in and when everyone goes home, right? And it's pretty easy to derive using a multitude of tools. Uh, every major array has, you know, GUIs and so on you could gather this type of statistic from. So when you see all that, you can start to quantify well, what does that really mean in terms of dollars and cents? How long does it take for someone to sit there and wait for their file to be either written or read back to them depending upon what their work requirements are. So again, think about that concept as we move forward. Now what I want to do primarily is focus on a couple slides and bear with me one sec. Okay. This, uh, this slide and the next slide. So this basically, I, I refer to this as our money slide. Because what this effectively shows from a high level is how our, basically our, our engine works, our optimization and deduplication engine. But what I'm going to do is talk about each one of these layers in detail. And I'm going to do it fairly quick because we are a little short on time. So one of our patents, one of our many patents, revolves around this layer, the application analysis layer, and this layer, the content awareness IO processing layer. So what we do upon ingest of data is we, we created a rolling hash mechanism. And this rolling hash is one of our patents, and I'm not going to get into the guts of how that works. But effectively what it does, it takes a 4K chunk of data, rolls every 4K chunks. We examine the IO pattern contained within that 4K chunk. And what we can effectively do is determine what type of application uh, generated that type of I.O. pattern, whether it's a virus scan, spreadsheet, you name it. What we do then is after we identify what that is, we have the ability of matching that against a table of, of these various types of uh, I.O. patterns to determine what type of um, application generated this. But more importantly, we have the ability of prioritizing different types of applications over others such that they get preferential treatment to go to the dedupe engine and eventually being written to disk or to memory, whichever, it's a, whichever the situation requires, whether it's persistent or whether it's um, stateless. So I.O. processing, we identify the I.O. pattern, prioritize it. We can change it 
we have this heuristic mechanism where we actually change the prioritization mechanism over time. So as an example, let's say a user or multiple users have specific application for their install, and they use this application all the time. We can learn that and prioritize it predicated by not only what the I.O. pattern looks like, but how many times it's being used. So automatically we can place it at a higher up on the list and give it a prioritization mechanism. So that works for both writes and reads. Okay. Now, as Rod mentioned, we also have this coalescing or IE or IO blender fix mechanism, where effectively what we do is we take 4K chunks, which are normally random writes and random reads, okay, non-sequential reads and writes, which also, as you know, pay a high penalty. Okay? We coalesce them into sequential 64K or 128K blocks. Now, before we get to that point, we have to talk about the dedupe engine. Okay, so I talked about our, our processing identification. After we identify the application, then we start looking at the data. We utilize a similar hashing mechanism predicated on a rolling 4K hash, that's one of our patents, wherein we take every chunk that we possibly can, we remove it, we update it with a pointer and an index that appends to a um, that appends to an index um, in our file system journal before we actually end up writing it to disk. Okay, so obviously for in that example I'm referring to persistent. For non-persistent examples, the journal simply just writes it to memory because effectively our dedupe engine and our file system and the file system for all the VMs are effectively in memory where there's no disks. So what this allows us to do by using this rolling hash mechanism is remove a pro effectively approximately about 85 to 90 percent of the redundant data. And whatever is unique, what, doesn't, what effectively doesn't get deduped, is then either written to disk in the persistent type of uh, environment or, of course, will get saved to RAM in the stateless type of environment. So why I talk about that is how fast does RAM work relative to a disk? Exactly, as fast as the bus. So think about how fast that would be in terms of milliseconds per I.O. It goes from milliseconds per I.O. or tens of milliseconds per I.O. I'm sorry? Correct, yes. So, um, right, that's right, it is done well. So think about the time. I mentioned earlier, right, the read-write penalties on hydration for reads and writes for RAID. IOPS equals latency. Now again, if we took it, you know, milliseconds, tens of milliseconds per IOP, we can you know figure out effectively how long a certain a certain file is going to take post dedupe or even without dedupe. Now, when you're looking at a stateless environment or even a persistent, we're utilizing basically 90% of dedupe data written locally, with only a minor amount written to disk. Think about now you're talking a scale of milliseconds or tens of milliseconds to microseconds. Okay. So think about that in terms of the RAID penalty. That's where, and now that scales. The scaling limits we have effectively are this, the amount of memory you can put in any given server. That's your scaling limit. And we have a multitude of sizing calculators that I'm sure we could certainly have either seen or we could show you that talk about both stateless and persistent environments. That talk about uh, you know, how many VMs we could use per, mem per gigabyte of memory and so on. But the point being is this. Think about the scaling factor in terms of the time it saves for those. Now, let's talk about Citrix and let's talk about PVS. Okay, what is PVS? It's effectively an overflow caching mechanism that's placed on a disk someplace or multiple or a LUN or something along those lines, right? So think about that same penalty, RAID, RAID penalty for writes, hydration upon reads. So if I have a large Citrix cluster with a large PVS cache, and I'm constantly hitting that cache, what can I do? And the answer is add more disks, right? So again, it starts exacerbating this problem of reads and writes, latency, and so on. Now, what does Atlantis do? What we do is we utilize, again, our engine, right? IOP, our IOP, op, or, excuse me, IO optimization, deduplication engine, application analysis engine, basically our IO pattern matching, and we effectively carve out 
upon the sizing a piece of memory for the PVS cache. So at that point, what happens is for Citrix users, rather than going to disk and utilizing disk IOPS, you're utilizing local RAM IOPS on the bus. So again, you have that tens of microseconds, tens of milliseconds down to microseconds for each IOP. So what does it do? You have significantly improved performance, a significantly reduced um, disk and storage based footprint. And ultimately what you have is the same or preferably in most cases better than uh, desktop performance. Okay? So that's effectively in a high level, in some in some cases a low level, what I really want to talk about today. So IO matching, rolling 4K hash. Now what I want to also talk about since we do have a couple more minutes is let's talk about the compression a little bit. So in the in the situation of utilizing a non-persistent, I'm sorry, excuse me, a persistent uh, rollout where we have, you know, session host, replication host, what happens in these cases is we do have unique data that we have to save to disk. Typically, after post-dedupe, you're looking at, you know, 10%, okay? What we have the ability of doing is compressing that data after it's written to disk, okay? So that's where this compression mechanism comes in. And effectively, this is uh, primarily for uh, persistent environments. So again, what you get is two things. Inline deduplication before we write to disk. When you write to disk, we do a, effectively a compression of that data on disk. The total reduction value typically is about 91 to 96%. Okay, so again, getting back to IOPS, latency, scale, think about what that might do. Dramatically improves your IOPS, in terms of performance per IOP, it dramatically reduces the number of IOPs, reduces your disk footprint, improves end user performance and user experience. So, I mean, it sounds like your elevator pitch is you're basically a NAS with a bunch of memory that does uh, compression and debug. I guess from a really high level, that would be one way of looking at it, sure, because um, at that point, it, you know, what's the difference between us and an NAS box? Obviously, there's no hardware, right? We're a software-only solution, and as Rod mentioned, we are hypervisor agnostic. We're storage agnostic. We don't really care because the, the goal really is this. We're going to be as fast as the memory is in the box that we're installed on. That's going to be the gating factor in terms of our performance. But as far as NAS goes, so one thing that a NAS box would do that is somewhat something we are not really geared for is, you know, we have really no protocol uh, dependencies, right, like a NAS would, right? So if you have, like, well, in that respect, yes. So what I was referring to is when you, um, like, say, in a Windows box, you're going to, if you map a network drive, you map to a NAS using SIFS as an example, right? Or if you're a Linux host or Unix host, you use NFS. So that's what I was referring to. Obviously, to the back-end data store, right, you have your choice of either NFS or iSCSI. So it's about one minute after one o'clock. I want to keep everybody on time, so I'd like to open up the floor for questions. You had, you had a slide, like three slides back, that kind of shows uh, you know, how we would see a VMware on the planet, which is uh, okay. you know, three slides back. Sure, let's see. Ah, okay. 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 So this slide effectively shows us um, from a high level what where Atlantis fits in the uh, architecture of an ex existing installation, right? So we have our own VMDKs, we have our own OVF files. Uh, or XVA, depending upon where we're being installed into. Um, so effectively, we look like a VM. The difference is we also look as as our own data store. Okay, so we have our own data store, and that's what we that's what we utilize as the basis point for VMs to be migrated on top of us. So if you have existing data stores that point to physical storage. Instead, you would migrate those to the Ilio, the Atlantis Ilio data store. Effectively, which uh, in most well, if it's persistent, would obviously uh, utilize local RAM as well as the disk back end, and stateless would be purely RAM only. Um, so this also talks a little bit about um, how we'd apply our engine in a um, end-to-end -end format. So, right, random I.O., 
it, we, when we upon ingest using our VMDK, we, uh, even though this says inline dedupe, we actually perform multiple functions. We, again, we perform the IO matching. Our heuristic determines if we you know, create a prioritization mechanism based upon the IO pattern. Our rolling 4K hash performing our dedupe. And then depending upon what we have uh, the installation, in this case it's going to be persistent, uh, we have what we refer to as our vscaler. And our vscaler is an internal mechanism that we utilize that effectively is our IO coalescing engine. That's another term for it that we use internally. Um, and then our IO scheduler effectively takes the IO, schedules it for, or queues it up for uh, transit to the back end storage. But effectively, that's a high level view of what, uh, where Atlantis fits. Your appliance is sitting on a physical storage. Well, actually, no. So we're not a member. We're not an appliance. We're. I'm sorry. So, your question was: We're effectively is our appliance is our appliance sitting on top of RAM? Or I'm I'm sorry, on top of. I'm sorry. I said RAM, but it's uh, you know, it's looking at that. How's it how's it connecting to the RAM? You show the diagram there. Right, so the question is, how do we physically connect to the SAN from the ILEO itself? So the answer is this. So those physical connections, um, assuming this is a pre-existing solution, are already in place, right? So this is an existing SAN solution to the disk back end. What we effectively do is you install our software uh, on top of the hypervisor, right? So hypervisor on top of the physical storage here. I'm sorry, the physical server platform. Uh, we sit between the VMs, the hypervisor, and the storage. So we perform the last bits of I.O. before any data is written off to memory or written off the disk. That's where our engine takes place. So again, we're not a physical appliance. We're a piece of software, right? a software appliance that sits, again, between the hypervisor, the VMs, and the physical storage. Yes? So you said that Atlantis, as a VM, presents itself as a data store. Correct. Um, within the hypervisor, right? Yes. So not the size of that data store by the amount of RAM you carve out for Atlantis? Absolutely. So the question for everyone on the uh, go to meeting is uh, effectively what is the scaling limits or what's the limit of any given data store? And the answer is we perform an initial sizing as part of any installation. And that sizing is predicated off of the physical resources that are available in the servers. So that's going to basically dictate how many VMs and the size of the data store that uh, can be used at any given time. Okay, I'm sorry. One at a time. So, so go ahead. Uh, what are you seeing on the upper end in terms of sizing for Atlantis? So the upper end. So I guess the upper end that I have seen, and you guys can help out. Yeah, I think what <clears throat> what what you see is no more than 150 bits of rotation. And maybe when you see the only four years in one block, right? So um, that's kind of the rule of thumb that you see at that limit. So say you have a host failure, it's going to impact everything running on. talk about failure, sure. So for the folks in the group meeting, the question really is, what happens in the event of a failure? So let's talk about that. There's two different scenarios. Scenario number one is stateless. If it goes down, we're at the mercy of the physical server at that point, which means that the physical server goes down, everything connected to it goes down with it. So we have no impact there, one way or the other. Okay, no different than a hypervisor, no different than any other VM. Now in, in the scenario of state, I'm sorry, uh, um, persistent, right, we have a replication host, multiple session hosts. If a session host has a physical cat has a catastrophic failure, we do have a fast replication process that takes place where all the VMs that were there, right, we have a piece, we basically have a, on the replication host, a mechanism to fast clone all of them to a second or a third or uh, a, a persistent session host, okay? So there's a replication mechanism that takes place. Now, as far as how long that takes, it really depends upon several factors. Um, it could be anywhere from, Gosh, I think the fastest I've seen is probably two minutes to 20 minutes, depending upon you know things like number of uh, VMs, the amount of memory, the amount of data, uh, the network that sits in between, the saturation of the network that sits in between. So there's all these different factors that come into that. But effectively, we guarantee that if a catastrophic failure takes place, we will not lose any data. 
And that's very important to understand. In a persistent environment, the whole point is we don't lose any data. Okay. Between, you know, between 7 and 10 set modes per recitation mode, and they all, uh, you know, real time setting their data to recitation mode, which is another VM on a host. Yep. It's doing virtual view loops and from there, and I leave the thing down to back end storage. So when everyone has failed using HA, you know, tools within VMware, et cetera, it will fill it over, bring it up um, between either session modes or the replication modes. Everything's built in. Effectively, it is a cluster. That is correct. Okay. And then we do have the ability, as Noel mentioned, to basically leverage the HA capabilities within VMware. We have these cross mounted this, this concept of cross mounting. So if you had a cluster to cluster type of failure or something along those lines, you can um, still again leverage the same same type of recovery mechanism. So you, sir, you had a question. I'm sorry, you both had a question at the same time. Uh, okay. So the question was, what's the typical dedupe ratio? Typically, it ranges between uh, before compression. Let's talk about straight dedupe. Uh, anywhere from 85 to 91 percent. So if you, that's that's for the dedupe. Okay, compression after writing disk, as we talked about in the persistent scenarios, will add effectively a few more percentage points on top of that. So the end end net net is going to be approximately 91 to 97 percent. In that range. So when we can't say 98 because then plan seven you write it. So we can say lower and then <laughs> and then you'll see it. But specifically it's the 90. But the scenario you described we get hundred what was the number you mentioned about the hundred? Oh well right between you know, no more than one thirty <coughs> is the kind of the high, but you see between you know seventy five and hundred and twenty is kind of the sweet spot. I mean I and there you can get you know four terabyte RAM value that we did nothing you could provide. I mean um, you know, the other thing too, when you have these questions around sizing, is um, if you have access uh, to our sizing calculators, if you receive those, if not, we can certainly send them to you. Um, it's a simple spreadsheet. Plug in the numbers, and you can see by going through different vendors' websites to look at their server capabilities, and I get an idea of what they can do, in both a stateless as well as a persistent environment. I'm sorry, you said you had a question. Okay, so the question is, for best practices, um, do we recommend running our Atlantis Elios on uh, hosts that contain hypervisors as well as VMs, or should we segregate them? So the answer is it doesn't really matter. Um, I've seen them both, deploy both ways. The challenge you have, though, is this. You have to be very careful about the amount of memory being used by the hypervisor itself and by the VMs that are also on that specific uh, physical server. Okay, so that's where it comes, that's where sizing becomes a little more critical. But aside from that, there's an And that's that's a very good question. So the question was, how about CPU over allocation? The answer is that's absolutely a potential problem. And that, again, gets into sizing, right? So we have our recommendations for the number of CPU cores that we recommend is for any given situation, uh, as well as, you know, obviously the sizing predicated off the amount of memory and so on. So one of the challenges gets into, well, when do we run out of CPU? And that's where it gets into running through sizing. And when you have the situation that you described, sizing becomes even more critical. So what I'd recommend is this. If you get into that situation where a customer wants to absolutely run Atlantis Elio on a hypervisor with uh, independent VMs on the same physical server, contact one of us and let, let us help you size that properly because we don't want to obviously have over allocation of CPU or memory for obvious reasons. Yep, yep. So yep. in turn, for example, if I'm managing VMs mm -hmm. for this type of stuff, so say I have two images, one with a two different OS, mm -hmm. would I manage each one of those three images as a, as a individual VM? Yeah, so that, that's a great question. So the question for the folks uh, remotely, um, what does the end user see when we have, say, multiple image types or multiple VM types? And the answer is nothing. It, it's no change. Now, we do have some best practices around 
uh, if we have different types of images, like say for an example, 64 versus 32-bit images, we do recommend that we, we segregate them on two different Atlantis ILIOs, if possible. It's, not a, not a, uh, it's a recommendation, not a hard requirement. But as far as the end user performance and end user experience goes, and from administration standpoint, they effectively look the same. They're not administered any differently. As if, exactly, absolutely. It's effectively a different data store. That's the only change. Yes. So branches are branches. Starting the game in RAM, that's that group. If you're doing a lot of other processing, you know, the CPU processor, you know, the way that you're going to play with the IOs, clocks, and then you've got your threads and all that. How does the step that you're actually doing in between with the raw reading and writing the data and then the actual? Okay, so, so the folks remotely, the question was, how does our processing engine, the ILIO processing engine, um, add to end-to-end -end latency? So at the CPU level, um, so I've seen anywhere from, uh, it adds per operation, oh gosh, let me think, let me think. Um, I want to say it's less than 100 microseconds per operation. So it's pretty pretty quick. Um, and part of that is this. Um, the, the biggest chunk of what we see in terms of processing in our engine is our deduplication engine. So one of the challenges, and again, I'll refer to one of my former employers, they utilized a SHA-1 based mechanism for hashing. So SHA-1 has a very, very large uh, footprint, which also has a very, very low level or low probability of collisions. So, but, but you pay a price for it in CPU. So what we did is we looked at, well, how can we get that same level of coverage, but with 120 or 110th uh, the amount of processing. So that's one of our patents. So our dedupe engine uh, effectively utilizes a rolling hash using 4K chunks and a proprietary hashing algorithm that we created that effectively gives you SHA-1 based coverage, but about 10% of the processing power. So what that does in terms of the, the coalescing, the heuristic learning engine, the prioritization, the IOP, I'm sorry, the IO recognition, all that together I believe is about 100 microseconds. I, could, I need to verify that, but that's the number I remember. Um, I could certainly provide more data for you because I know we have access to it. We've done studies on this. I just, on the top of my head, that's the best answer I give you right now. At the end of the day, what comes down to is what you use happy and the CFR happy. Well, yeah, that, 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 yeah, ultimately. So on that note, uh, Rod, uh, you know, what would you recommend that next step if you're looking for information? Sure, so if customers are interested in this, <coughs> um, we can do an ROI analysis. That's usually the best. It's, it's very simple. We give you a discovery document, maybe take five minutes to pick it out. And you give it back to us. We'll run an ROI analysis. We can either jump in a virtual meeting session with you. We can show you what you're either going to pay per desktop in your current environment or what you're paying, and then what you would pay with Atlantis. And then we can do a download. How do you license it? You put it to desktop. Put it for the same visual. Yeah, you did that. Okay. Yep. And what does it cost per visit? It's usually different. It's about 5000 dollars per run. Yeah, but just kind of, as a preview, right, this is all big guy focused today, and I'll give you a little, you know, uh, pitch into the future. Um, we install this on each host, so, you know, 10,000 VDI is going to have size in per each DSA host or, 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 or session host. Uh, in a couple of months coming out of the server workload, mm -hmm. we're then going to go after everything else, SharePoint Exchange, databases, you name it, doing the same thing. For those who had demoed last week, um, we had a demo in our booth, we had a six node cluster, Pretty all RAM and generate more than 1.2 million IOPS from that six, six, those six nodes of, of server. So the need for back and high end storage can become less relevant. VMware and Osprey is moving all these data services into the hypervisor layer near the host. So putting RAM, the you know, cost of RAM is coming down, leveraging existing infrastructure with your server host, whatever that may be, creating this data layer of tier where you can turn on a dial whatever application you want in a cloud-type format, it's unbelievable IOPS at a price point that 
couple servers and ran close to, you know, what what the main line of code was like. Did you feel seen? We did. Yep. What was that involved? I understand your environment, kind of been a sizing. I mean, basically a PSC was that like two, three hours, right? Once you install it, you understand the images, everything else, you know, you get 20, 30, 40 uh, DDI, run it. You have, you have a picture before what you're kind of seeing from a performance, uh, back in storage, etc., and then post studio and kind of see the, you know, the before and after. Just take that document and it shows you your eye front from here to here and your back to your front from here to here. The installation of, of the software goes after, obviously, after the hypervisor installed. So yeah. a host would have to be dedicated to this, or an existing host would have to install the software. And when did this new production environment go in the same set? But we can do it remotely. I mean, we've done it remotely for customers where we get them on a go to a meeting, we download the software for them on their, on their system, they run it for a few hours, and then we spit out a document we show here's exactly the impact it's going to have on them. Yeah, it's pretty quick and easy. You just need the, 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 the pre work to get prepared and size and everything else takes the most work. But what, what's involved with upgrading your images? Because I'm just thinking on a large scale deployment, you have 24 7 operations and that's just healthcare. You know, it takes and it uses such a stateless model. You know, you may have people with devices out there that are in real time running, but you need to upgrade them. You need to coalesce, you know, take an image that you've already upgraded or what have you and, and kind of combine it to the existing image that's out there. I'm just kind of curious how would you do that on a, on a large scale deployment? I mean, without having everybody shut down and, and reload their EDI sensors on your new. I think it's a year and send up to that for you. Right? Yeah, we have some stuff in our tools too. For example, JP Morgan Chase, right? They can do uh, four ninety thousand and eighteen hours every every you know month or two months. Your purpose is we have to have everything. Right, I'm just saying it's already loaded in RAM. How do you get that those changes and filters that were made, you know, where was that and said, you know, uh coalesce into these elements? Uh, I'm a Delta. I'm <laughs> 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 I'm on this man, I don't sure. I'll send it to yeah. <laughs> so the, the, the question for the remote folks is, um, in a production environment, in a stateless production environment, if we have to upgrade the user images or install the Ilio uh, uh, software, what's the appropriate mechanism for doing that? And what's, what's, what would allow us to accomplish that with the minimal amount of impact to the user? So as far as the installation goes, that can be done in production. Okay, so the installation, uh, obviously all the sizing work done beforehand, but the installation can be done live. The challenge is this. When we want to migrate from the existing data stores to the new ILIA data stores, that's where you run into a little more of a challenge where you're going to effectively, doing that in production um, requires a lot of cloning. So it is possible. But our recommendation would be to do it during a downtime window, if that's possible. But it's certainly possible to do it during production, but there's going to be a price you'll have to pay. And that price you have to pay would be a momentary, well, momentary or large, uh, 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 window of time where performance will degrade right, during that migration period. So in terms of how long that will take, you know, we certainly can help you analyze that predicated off the workload and what time of day would be best, most beneficial. And we could certainly have people on site to help you if need be or remote uh, available. Yeah, we have a team in Dudley, George, Flint, right? The team out now is working the array that came from 15,000 to yep. 75,000 desktops, right? So yep. the best in operational lives, we get it down. I think that's yep. one of our. Well, yeah, and that's why I mentioned healthcare because it's really a normal point for healthcare that the yep. downtime is just going to be yep. small. Sure. Not existent. Sure. So, yep. No. You know, operating room. Yep. Mm -hmm. Although several things that seem like. <laughs> If you guys like to stick around, ask some more questions, feel free, but thank you so much for coming. We'll have to see you next week.